Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. I am thrilled to announce my new series called Last Week on Wall Street. This is a series where I'm gonna dive into some of the biggest headlines and stories from this last week in finance. So everything ranging from investment banking, consulting, private equity, and venture, not just in the US, but globally. We have a lot to dive into from this last week. But before doing that, if this is your first time on my channel, then hey, my name is Cameron Galbraith. I'm a finance professional here in New York City. I make tons of content every week, all aimed at educating and inspiring this next generation of business leaders, which is you. So definitely subscribe so you don't miss any of that content. And with that said, let's dive into this last week on Wall Street. So these are the biggest news stories from this last week, June 17th to the 21st. First up, we have an update on the US economy. That is obviously a very major news going into the election in a few months. Then, because I wanna focus globally too, we're gonna to dive into what's going on over in New Zealand. And finally, the elephant in the room, NVIDIA, we're gonna talk about their market cap update and how they just continue to keep growing. And we're gonna jump into the Guzman e Gomez IPO, which is one of the biggest IPOs in Australia in the last five years. Next up, we're also gonna talk about private equity firms investing in soccer teams, especially on the women's side. We've got a very high growth startup that just raised a big Series A. Netflix is expanding into brick and mortar retail and Cristiano Ronaldo is getting into private equity himself. And finally, there's some other news going on in private equity and there is a bit of a drought in terms of exits and transactions. So with that said, first up, US retail sales. This is one of the bigger headlines and that is that retail sales actually increased just 0.1% month over month in May of 2024. This is below what economists thought it was gonna be of that 0.2% increase. So this means that the higher interest rates are kind of working. Again, it's confusing because it's still an increase, but it's not as much of an increase as they were thinking. Um, so that was good news in terms of the Fed rates going down, which is what a lot of business people want to see just because it makes it very hard to get money, to especially to buy homes. So as a consumer, that's a big aspect of it too. Um, and so, the lower spending means that rates are actually impacting the consumer, which for a while we felt that we weren't seeing. Despite the Fed continuously increasing rates, everybody was still purchasing, everything was still kind of flying um, with, with flying colors. And so that's why we haven't seen inflation go down quite as much as we would have liked. Um, but this is definitely some big news here just because it looks like what Jerome Powell is doing is working. Now let's get into New Zealand. So New Zealand had Q1 growth of 0.2%, which meant it was 0.3% year over year. They are finally exiting their recession and they are experiencing some growth for the first time in quite some time. You'll see here that the notable growth has come in the rental hiring and real estate services section. They also have seen some rise in electricity, gas, water, so all of the utilities. With that said, they are still expected to have some pretty minimal growth over the course of the year. And their Royal Bank has maintained interest rates um, because of inflation, like every other country in the world. But I think it's really interesting to see what's going on over in New Zealand. And now NVIDIA. So NVIDIA, again, this is fluctuating day by day, but they at one point became the most valuable company in the world, surpassing Microsoft, Apple, Google, obviously, Everybody, this is huge news. It passed $3.4 trillion, um, which is just insane. NVIDIA, they sell AI hardware and software, including supercomputers. Um, so it's all about GPUs, all about AI. They are really fueling that. So that's why NVIDIA has almost served as a bit of like an index um, for AI. And so it's just been a crazy, crazy explosion for them. The things to watch here though is market concentration. So it is a pretty concentrated market um, and they have an earnings report coming up in August. So that'll be interesting to see if they can keep beating analyst expectations. It is obviously valued extremely high. So you have to think 
you know, is it only going to go up or at some point is it going to come back down? Um, we will see in August, but that is definitely some huge news just because five years ago, most people had never heard of NVIDIA and now it is the largest company in the world. So now going into the Guzman y Gomez IPO. So this happened over in Australia this last week. It was the largest IPO in Australia so far this year. But more importantly, it's been the third best performing IPO in Australia in the last five years. So the shares surged uh, 36% uh, to an Australian $30 and it brought, sorry about the spelling error, that's my fault. They brought the market cap to around 3 billion uh, Australian dollars, which is pretty major. Um, so what does Guzman y Gomez do? If you haven't heard of them, kind of similar to me. They are a quick service restaurant that offers Mexican inspired foods. They're mostly based in Australia, Singapore, Japan, and the US. I'm not sure where they are in the US, but they only operate 210 restaurants, which is pretty crazy when you consider it's a $3 billion market cap. Um, but they do plan to expand to over a thousand Australian restaurants. And for comparison, McDonald's only has about a thousand in Australia, or I guess I shouldn't say only, but that puts them right at the same space as McDonald's in terms of the country's kind of availability of fast food. Um, but they do have a bit of a different corporate philosophy. They promote healthier, more wholesome alternatives to traditional takeout, and they emphasize ethical sourcing and environmental sustainability. I think also, just from my perspective, them being a Mexican brand in Australia is a little bit more unique there than maybe it may be here in the US where there's Chipotle, Doba, Cava. There's, there's just a lot of kind of alternatives um, that are pretty similar. So in their IPO, they raised $335 million, priced at $22 per share. Like I said, that per share price did pop uh, over 30% on their first day of trading. They did experience $259 million in revenue for this last year, which is a 51% increase year over year. So I think that is probably why analysts and investors are excited about this opportunity. Surprisingly, Morningstar, they valued the stock at just $15 a share, saying that the company's expansion plans are a bit ambitious and may not actually happen, which therefore would hurt the share price. Um, so in terms of the future outlook, domestic business is expected to be the primary sales driver, and that is in Australia. And there clearly is some strong investor appetite, despite some of the warnings from Morningstar. Next up, we are diving into private equity, where Carlisle is getting into the women's soccer space. So this week, the Seattle Sounders and Carlisle closed a $58 million deal to acquire the National Women's Soccer League's Seattle Reign. This was put up for sale in 2022 by the OL Group, which is now selling 97% of the shares and 100% of the shares to the consortium. So they were selling this. They've, it's been up for sale for the last two years, and they finally got the deal closed and closed by Carlisle. Um, Alex Popov, Carlisle's head of private credit, is going to assume a role as alternate governor. And he said that he and Carlisle are huge believers in the ecosystem and have explored ways to invest more broadly, but we're now entirely focused on our investment in the Seattle rain. This matters because big firms like Carlisle and other huge corporations have really started to invest in women's sports, specifically women's soccer. They see this as a huge growth potential. And this makes sense just because the valuation of certain NFL teams and NBA teams is pretty inflated. That doesn't mean that there's not room for growth, but I think in the women's space, it just makes a little bit more sense in terms of an investment, especially on the private equity side where they can make it happen in the next five to seven years. We've seen the rights of the WNBA TV deals explode thanks to Caitlin Clark and just other um, you know, micro people in the space just bringing a lot of attention. And so there's no reason to think that can't happen for women's soccer, especially now that this year is an Olympics year. That always seems to bring a lot of eyeballs to the sport and again, increased attention to the actual US league. So this does create some positive expectations for women's professional soccer. It, like I said, there has been a lot of investment in the space recently. The San, the San Diego Wave sold for a league record $120 million. Um, there also was a deal that was sold for $63 million. So there has been a lot of transactions going on in this space. Again, because I think a lot of the firms are seeing the growth potential. 
Now getting into the venture side of things, GPT Zero raised a series A, they raised $10 million and this valued the company at about 50 million. And the reason that this is big news is because as much as we've seen kind of AI and how it's gonna transform education, and that might be scary to certain educators and teachers, GPT-0 is more on the administrator side. So it has really strong AI content detection. So that means that they're able to dive in and understand if something is generated by AI, which is a huge thing that a lot of schools have grappled with. Um, just we've all seen how valuable and how efficient ChatGPT can write an essay about anything. And so that has caused a lot of issues for teachers and universities just as they, they grapple with how to grade and how to assess that. And they also, though, serve not just schools, but also government agencies and AI data labelers. So they ensure that content is authentic and is developing tools to detect AI hallucinations, which is another huge aspect of AI that we need to figure out. So moving into consumer retail, Netflix is expanding their services into a Netflix house, which is a 100,000 plus square foot retail space. They're doing this in Dallas and Pennsylvania. Um, this is a place where fans can immerse themselves in the worlds of shows like Bridgerton, Squid Game, kind of anything under the Netflix umbrella. And this initiative leverages Netflix's original content to create new business opportunities, similar to what Disney does um, with their own intellectual property. So visitors at the Netflix house can enjoy immersive experiences, shop for merchandise, and savor themed food and drinks. This move is part of Netflix's broader strategy to expand its physical presence and maintain viewer engagement beyond the home. And what I find interesting about this is that they're doing it in malls. They're not taking the Disney approach or even Lego land and Universal where they have to develop a huge plot of land. This is still a, a major investment, but a little bit of a lighter load. And it's already in places where there's a ton of consumer foot traffic. So I think it's a pretty smart choice. I don't know if it's the best investment. We've seen a lot of similar things fail in the past. My mind goes to Wanna Do City, which if you're from Florida, you may be familiar with. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunity here because it's not just cater towards children. Not that Disney and Universal don't get plenty of adults, we all know that, um, but I think that this is just such a, the initial target audience is not just children. And so there's a lot of opportunity here. And it's just, you know, a fun thing for them to do. Now, going back into private equity, Cristiano Ronaldo actually has an investment. Uh, he purchased a 10% stake in Visa Allegre. Atlantis through CR7SA, which is his private equity fund, and they plan to acquire 30% of the Spanish uh, franchise of that soon. Vista Alegre is like a porcelain company. They make very luxurious plates, which is interesting, but again, that's where private equity seems to, to do its most damage. Um, I shouldn't say damage, but where they find a lot of opportunities in those really niche sectors like porcelain luxury plates. Um, so Ronaldo and Vista Alegre have agreed to a 50-50 joint venture in the Middle East and Asia to promote the brand um, and the brands across their portfolio. This partnership aims to accelerate the global expansion of these brands in the prestige and luxury segment, leveraging Ronaldo's global influence with the exact investment amount undisclosed. And I think this obviously makes a ton of sense as a brand, just realistically, if they didn't take this investment from Ronaldo, I never would be talking about them. No one would have ever heard of them. And so regardless, this is just an amazing opportunity for them and just a smart decision for Ronaldo. It's a cool opportunity for him to see just what the power of his brand really is. And finally, the last slide, the last story of the week is the exit drought in private equity. So private equity firms are increasingly using dividend recapitalizations, uh, which is issuing new debt to pay shareholders with transactions reaching a record $33 billion this year, surpassing previous peaks. So, so what this means is the private equity firms are recapitalizing their debt so that they can then have the cash to give back to the investors. And despite high interest rates, private equity firms resort to dividend recaps to satisfy the limited partners that are demanding distributions due to difficulties in exiting investments and managing swollen portfolios. That's an issue that we see quite a bit in private equity. Typically, firms hold their investments for five to seven years, which compared to the public markets, when if you need to, you can exit uh, and be liquid very quickly. That's a lot harder if you're invested in private equity, which a lot of 
pension funds and things like that are. And so it's an interesting space. And realistically, the dividend recaps can harm portfolio companies and employees, especially if the economic conditions worsen. So if the rates were to get even worse, the economic outlook were to get even worse, it's longer term before an exit can actually occur. It would just kind of create a compounding effect of issues for the portfolio companies and the investors. Um, so this highlights the challenges that the funds are facing amid, amidst exit routes and the long term consequences of this are yet to be seen. So that is going to wrap up this last week on Wall Street. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into several of the top stories. Let me know what you think down below in the comments. I'd love to hear what story you think is the most interesting. I think myself, I find the Carlisle investment in the soccer team the most interesting just because that's been an expanding, expanding space. We've seen the TV rights for women's leagues just explode. And I think just anytime private equity gets involved, it means that there's a pretty high opportunity for growth there. So really interested to see where that goes moving forward. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. As I said, make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of my content. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.